name is Tim Bidall, and I've got the great privilege of serving as lead pastor here. And I would invite all of you to open to the book of Hebrews this morning. We've been in a series that we've entitled Hebrews, the greatest name of all time being Jesus. And we've been learning about this, and we find ourselves in this journey through this letter that was written 30 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, written to a group of individuals who found themselves pressed down and persecuted because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And this letter of exhortation, this letter of encouragement is there written to these group of individuals to press on, to not give up, to not give in, and to grow a muscular faith that is able to endure uh, the, the, sta- the tough times that come before them. Now, last week in Hebrews chapter uh, three, we came to a history lesson. A history lesson about a generation who had seen the greatness of God throughout their lives. In fact, each and every day, new mercies of God were experienced every morning. This generation had experienced the rescue of God from bondage of slavery out of Egypt. They had been rescued and God had seen them through every step of the way. We learned about how God fed them with manna from heaven, how God gave them drink from a rock, how God ministered and led and guided them with a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire so they knew where to go. God had protected them by parting the Red Sea and allowing them to walk on dry land. For years, this group of people had experienced the grace and the mercy of God. And you would have thought, you would have imagined that amidst all of that, they would have done what we just did. Oh, praise the name of our God. That they would have lifted up the name of the God who had rescued them and provided for them and done all of that. But Hebrews chapter three says, they didn't get what God had for them. They did not see the fulfillment of God's promises in their life because they presumed upon the grace of God and the blessing of God and they rebelled. And that is a reminder to all of us to be careful. Now this generation of individuals was esteemed greatly by the Jews of the first century. Their little temple schools that their kids would be a part of. They would have spoken about this generation. And there was a temptation by many of the Hebrews in the first century to think much, to even in fact revere this generation as a generation that they wished they could have been a part of. We do that often. If I just had lived during the days of Jesus, if I'd only just seen the miracles of Jesus, I would have believed more than I do now. And that's what that generation in the book of Hebrews is looking at. They're looking at the past and saying, I wish we could be like them. Growing up, I remember I had a a baseball coach. I was seven or eight years of age, and my baseball coach at the time was the coolest guy I had ever met. He seemed to have a way with words, he was athletic, he drove a great car, he lived in a nice house. And I remember as a young boy thinking, I wanna be just like coach so-and-so. And And I remember even thinking, I I wanna imitate how he acts, how he talks. I remember he told some jokes and I'm like, I gotta tell those jokes because if I act like him, then I'll be like him. And it was probably the first sense of betrayal I had that it wasn't too long after that time where he was coaching me that I began to hear as a young boy of all the garbage that he had going on in his life. He had cheated on his wife with numerous ladies. He had gotten himself into criminal uh, trouble at his job. And I began really feeling like, wait a minute, this guy that I held up, this guy that I wanted to be, in fact, wasn't what I should be at all. He wasn't an example of, Tim, this is what you should strive for. It became an example of, Tim, this is what you need to stay away from. You see, the people in the book of Hebrews held up that wilderness generation that had been rescued out of Egypt. They held them up as someone they looked up to. And the writer says, but listen, they shouldn't be looked up to. They should be viewed as a cautionary tale of what not to do. Because in the end, after all those mercies, after all those graces, they did not experience the 
rest that God wanted to give them. Now, this morning, we are going to go kind of all over the place. We're going to get technical. We're going to deal with a lot of different things that are going on in this text. But I want you to know, as we meander, if you will, through the wilderness of this message, there's a point. And there's a very serious point. And there's a very pointed point, okay? This is a fine point that what the author wants to get into our heads and our hearts and in our lives is the following. In this world... And in this life, you are going to be tempted to go after all manner of things, thinking you know how to live your life better than God does. But God is offering today the rest that you and I are so badly looking for. And if we will, out of obedience and faith, believe the promises of God, we will experience the rest God wants to give us. And so let's look at Hebrews chapter 4. Starting in verses 1 through and going through a verse 11. Here's what our text says. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear. Let any of us uh, should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, And those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, God appoints a certain day. Today, saying through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whomever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. There's a lot there and we're going to unpack it point by point. And so let's just ask for God's blessing on our time this morning. Father God, we come before you and we ask now that you would speak to our hearts. We ask, Lord, that as you speak to our hearts, that we would open our hearts to listen. Lord, I pray that as a result of what we see in this text of these, this example and your overwhelming grace of offering rest again and again, that we might receive it and live in the life of abundance and blessing that you have given to us. So I pray, Lord, we'll grab a hold of it today. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So, what's the text about? It's not hard to figure out right away that the text is about this thing called rest. Now, right away, when we think of rest, some of you are like, I could use some rest right now. Tim, keep talking, and I'll be asleep really, really soon. But we are a people who are so badly in need of rest. We are a tired people. We are an exhausted people. In fact, a recent study of Americans that was done just earlier this summer said over 60% of Americans find themselves daily at a place of exhaustion. Now, we try to address this issue of exhaustion through all manner of things. We buy expensive mattresses. We buy expensive uh, pillows that say when we lay ourselves down, we're going to experience the rest that we're looking for. We try to find all other antidotes. We drink millions of uh, cups of coffee each and every day. We drink this whole new style of drinks called energy drinks to get us out of exhaustion and into a place of production and vitality. But let's face it. What we're facing in this year, this 2020, a good nap or a good night's sleep isn't going to remedy We are longing for something. We are yearning for something in this world. And sadly, as we go and try to find what ails us, we find that what the world offers isn't good enough. 
This what was, was what was going on during Jesus' earthly ministry. Jesus, when looking at a, a worn out and exhausted and tired group of people, he said, come to me, all you who are weary, who are exhausted, who are tired, and he says, I will give you rest. Now, what Jesus isn't saying is, you come to me, you'll sleep better at night. Jesus is not ambient for your sleeplessness or your exhaustion. What this restlessness is, is this restlessness of our hearts, seeking in the world to try to find the things that are going to fill us. And so we're on this all out journey all throughout the word thinking, well, this will fill me, that will fill me, that will bring abundance, that will bring me uh, a sense of satisfaction. And like the uh, great uh, rock theologian, I can't get no satisfaction, Mick Jagger said. I try, I try, I try, but I can't get it. And that Ongoing search for satisfaction is what exhausts us, even as followers of Jesus Christ. And what the devil loves to do is the devil loves to put you wandering after the things of this world, all the while knowing you're never going to find what you're looking for. And so he tempts you, try this, try this, try this. And that's why Jesus says in John 10, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy The devil wants to see you continually hit brick walls at the dead end alley that you're going through. But Jesus says, I have come that I might give you life and give it in all abundance. What is Jesus saying there? I have come to give you rest. A life of abundance, a life of joy, and a life of peace. Brothers and sisters, the thing that I pray for you most is that you will be a people who will have experienced the rest of God. Now, the Bible tells us from the Old Testament to the New Testament, that we are stuck with this malady of chronic, fatigued spirituality. It's a syndrome that faces us all. And we need the Lord to point us to the medication that will address this. And to be able to do it, we gotta go a whole bunch of places this morning. So let's start, there's four points to this message. Stick with it, because I think it will be a blessing to you in the end. First of all, we need to connect some dots. We need to connect the dots between the Old Testament Israel and us today. What the author has been doing is he's been using as an example a generation of people who had experienced the unending graces of God. And we learned about that last week, all that God had done. And what the author is wanting to do is to have us compare and contrast their experience and our own. Notice what he says, and this is where we see the compare and contrast. He says in verse 2, For good news came to us just as it came to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them. Right away we need to stop and say, listen, we're on the same journey as they are. We've experienced the same good news as they have. In fact, we've received even better news And so for us to fall into the same habits, into the same patterns of sin that they did is unthinkable for the New Testament believer. And so what the author wants us to do is to see some connections. There's three of them that I want you to write down. Number one, they, speaking of that nation of Israel, that generation, were spared through the Passover, and we too have been saved through a person. Now, real quick, we remember the Passover. The plagues are all hitting Egypt. Of course, this is as a result of Pharaoh not letting his people go, God's people to go and leave Egypt. And so through his representative Moses, these different plagues come. And the last plague is the striking down of the firstborn in all of Egypt. And what God says to his people is, listen, this is not for you. This is for those who rebel against me, the nation of Egypt. And so here's your out. By faith, I want you to do something. I want you to take blood of a sacrifice and I want you to put it on the doorpost of your home. And when you do that, by faith, the angel of the Lord is going to pass over your house and will spare you the death and wrath that is coming. And that's exactly what the children of Israel do. By faith, they believe God, 
and they are spared the wrath of God. Well, just as that generation was spared, you and I in an even greater way were spared, but I might change that word. We have been saved, not through a Passover lamb, but the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so by faith, we do not experience the wrath of God, but he passes over his wrath from us and mercy and grace are found in our hour of need. Now, right away, that nation of Israel, that generation would have thought, that's the day. The day of their redemption. And that day of redemption uh, was the time that they had passed over, their, the wrath that God had for them, and their release from their captor. For the believer, that's our salvation. God's wrath passes over us when we trust Christ as our Savior. The enemy, the devil is vanquished and no longer holds us in captivity, we are released. Now, right away, the children of Israel thought this, and I'm going to assure you that every one of us have thought this as well. When God rescued them and when God rescues us, that's the finish line. I've made it. I've gotten saved. I've been redeemed. But as you're going to see here in the Old Testament reference that he's using of this generation and us, our redemption is the beginning, not the end. Because what God then does is he says, okay, you've been redeemed, you've been saved, you've been rescued, now join me in a journey. And so they leave Egypt, and what they do is they now have to pass through the wilderness, And the passing through the wilderness is the time where they are going to learn to follow God, to follow him and his word. And God appointed a man, Moses, to lead them and to guide them. And along the way, God graces them through all of it. And so they pass through the wilderness. Well, just as the nation of Israel leaves Egypt, that's the starting line of their faith, not the end. They haven't gotten all that God wants them to receive. We too, at our point of salvation, we are rescued, we are saved, and now God releases us as individuals. He's redeemed and saved into a world, and the book of 1 Peter says, now we are aliens and strangers, we are pilgrims in this world. So they pass through this wilderness, they're on this journey where they're going to either experience God's goodness and and blessing by obeying God or experience his uh, discipline and the consequences of sin because of our disobedience. That's the journey we find ourselves in. It's the process or the path of sanctification. Well, what happens if we don't do that journey right? Well, we see their journey was cut short because of fear And we learn that our journey is made complete through faith. Now this is where we've got to understand positionally and practically. Positionally, we're saved, we've always been saved, we always will be saved. But we haven't experienced the fullness, that's the rest that's being talked about. Their journey wasn't complete the second they got out of Egypt's area code. Their journey was made complete, not in the wilderness when God brought all this grace and mercy of manna and all of the blessings he gave them. Their journey was complete when they took hold of the promised land that God had promised their, the patriarchs and their forefathers. They didn't get there. They didn't experience the fullness of God's promises in their life because when they got to the Jordan River, they seized up in fear. And God said, because of that, you will not enter my rest. Brothers and sisters, you and I will not experience the fullness of God's blessing and goodness in our lives if we allow fear to betray our faith. And God doesn't want that to take place. Now, let's put, a, let's put a pin there for a moment, okay? And what the author does then is he says, all right, now I want to talk to you about what this generation missed. 
And he does so talking about this idea of rest. And what we need to do is we need to categorize this rest because he talks about all these different rests and whose rest is this and whose rest is that. And we see God rested and then we see David talked about a rest and then Joshua led him into a rest. And then in verse 11, now we strive to enter, which we already did in verse 9 and 10, but now we enter it anew. What in the world is going on? I was asking that question on Monday and Tuesday this week. What's going on? in this text. And here's what we need to do. We need to categorize it. There are four rests that are spoken about. Rest number one is seen in our text in verses, uh, uh, verse four. We see the rest in creation. Okay? So here's the text. It tells us about this rest. It says the following, although God's works were finished from the foundation of the world, For God has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. That's the first rest. So God creates everything seen and unseen. On the sixth day, he creates man. And he looks at his creation after each of the days. And he says, it's good. And then he creates man and woman. The apex of his creation, he says, it's very good. On the seventh day which by the way has no ending to that day, God lived in a perpetual state of rest. What that means is God examined his works, he looked at his work that he had created, and he says it was good. And then he enjoyed his work, that is he sat back and as a creator would do, he enjoys what he's created and the relationship he has with that which he has created. Now, this would create a framework of how the Jewish people were to live their lives. For six days of a week they were to work, it was dedicated to them. But on the seventh day, a day that was to be made holy, they were to dedicate themselves to examining their work and enjoying the good that God had given to them. And so this is the pattern, the Sabbath rest. But what we're going to see is something betrayed that rest. Because if that rest was still around, then why do we need all these other rests? Well, here's the problem. That rest was there in the beginning. God created a garden of rest called the Garden of Eden. God put man and woman in that garden and everything went well for them. They planted something, it grew without weeds. Husband and wife have no shame with one another. There's total... um, Communion and intimacy with one another. There's no strife. There's no trouble. Animals are getting along. Everything is going as it should. Why? Because the Garden of Eden was a garden of rest. Well, man screwed up that rest. Adam and Eve disobeyed. And that rest that was there as a gift from God, man took away. Because man said, I want to live life according to my ways, not your ways. Listen, you will never enter God's rest doing it your way and not his. Adam and Eve show us that. And so God kicks them out of the garden of rest. And now from that point on, everything that man and woman do causes toil, pain, and sorrow. You plant a seed, it's going to grow weeds. You're going to work, the sweat of your brow is going to remind you that the world that was supposed to work with you is now working against you as a consequence of your sin. The very essence of bringing a child into this world, which should have been a joyous and grand thing, he says to women, it will be done with great pains. All of these consequences reminding us that we don't have the rest that we once did. The writer then moves on. And he says, okay, that's the first rest. We got to categorize that one. The second rest is the rest that we call the rest in Canaan. Now we go back and we go back to that generation that left Egypt. They had been promised for years, hundreds of years, that there was a rest that was coming. Here's God's graciousness. Adam and Eve forfeit the rest that God had given them in the garden. And God says, okay. I'm a merciful and kind God. I will offer a new rest to the people. And so he picks out for himself Abram. In Genesis chapter 12, he calls Abram out and he says, I want to show you a new rest. 
and he shows him the promised land. And right away, Abraham does what Adam and Eve does, and that is they don't enter into that rest because he makes decisions on his own. How apropos, he goes down to Egypt, and he does all kinds of crazy and stupid things, and we talked about that last fall when we looked at the life of Abraham. And Abraham makes a whole mess of his life. And what God says is even though Abraham didn't see his rest, didn't experience the rest, neither did his sons, that there was a rest that was coming, this promised land. Genesis ends with the life of Joseph, a descendant of Abraham's. And Joseph has been uh, made very big and very powerful in Egypt. One of the dying words of Joseph in Egypt is that when he dies and God fulfills his promise to bring his people into the promised land, Joseph says, don't forget my bones here. Pick up my bones, dig me up, and take my body with you. I want to be buried in the promised land. He believed in the promise that God had shared with his forefathers. And so this group of individuals coming out of Egypt, they've got Joseph's bones. They're carrying them out. How would you have liked that to have been your job for 40 years? You're the Joseph bone bearers, okay? And so you're carrying him around. Now notice what it says. It says, since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter it because of disobedience. Now go down to verse eight. For if Joseph had given them rest, God would not have spoken of a different day. So here's where the rest comes in for Canaan. That generation for 40 years wanders the wilderness. And God in his grace still says, listen, I know you're weary. I know you're tired. And he brings them to the doorstep of that rest. He brings them to the Jordan River. And God says to Moses, send spies in the land. I want to show you what I've had in store for you. So he sends 12 spies into the land. And what do they do? And by the way, this comes in from Numbers 13 and 14, if you want to write this down. This is where I'm pulling it from. The story goes like this. The 12 spies go into the land, and they look, and the jury's out, and the jury comes back, all 12 of them. You're not going to believe it. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. Uh, the vegetation and the food is amazing. We've never seen anything like this before. You would have thought they would have run straight into the promised land. That's how great it was. But in uh, Numbers, at the end of Numbers 13 and into Numbers 14, it says that fear struck their hearts, at least 10 of them. And 10 say, you know what else is big in there? Not just their vegetation, but the giants in the land. And their fear paralyzed them from going in. And so what we've got is they never experience the Canaan rest. Now Joshua takes them in, and the next generation, Joshua and Caleb, they lead them in, and they experience some level of rest, but they never experience the fullness of God's rest because here's the problem. They thought that rest was land. If we get the land. So now they have the land and the land's not good enough because they're afraid their enemies are going to steal their land. And so they say, we've got to have these judges. Someone's got to protect the land. And we get Samson and, and Deborah and these other ones that protect the land. And they're like, this isn't good enough. We need to be unified. We need a king. Samuel says to him, you don't need a king. Yes, we do. How are we going to protect the land unless we have a king who directs armies? So let's appoint ourselves a king. And instead of trusting God, they start trusting men. And all the while, they get all this land. And what does God do because they don't obey? Because it's about the land and not loving God. What do they do? They get taken over time and time again. Captivity and strife and all of this. They never experience rest. Can I just say this? Judaism without Jesus is all about land. Even today, isn't it amazing? It's all about land. And God says, that's not my rest. That's an appetizer. It's a foretaste of the rest I'm going to bring. So now, if David speaks of rest... Well, David's in the promised land. So the promised land isn't the rest. What is? He says there's another rest that is coming. Okay, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would have not spoken of another day later on. 
So there's this other rest. That's the rest of Calvary. You see, the rest that God was talking about since Genesis chapter 3 is there was an offspring from the woman that was going to finally and fully vanquish the enemy, the devil, and destroy enmity between God and man and reconcile them back to himself. That happened when Christ said, it is finished on the cross. And because of that, all who by faith believe and trust, they're saved. Now, this is where it gets complicated because right away you say, got it. We have entered into God's rest. Now, notice the text because this is where it gets a little squirrely. He goes on and he says, uh, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would have not spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Now, this is important. Verse 10, for whoever has entered, help me out. What tense is that? I'm not English, what tense? Past, they've entered God's rest. They've also rested, past tense, from his works as God did. Verse 11, okay. So you and I entered into God's rest when we trusted Christ as our Savior. Got it locked in. Nope, the author messes with us. Let us therefore strive to enter, what tense is that? present, not past, enter that rest. Wait a minute. I thought we already entered it. What the author is saying is you have positionally entered that rest, what is called justification. Now what God is inviting you to is a journey. You've been rescued from Egypt. Now you and I are in that wilderness season of our lives where we've got to trust God and we've got to believe in God. And good things are going to happen and bad things are going to happen. And amidst it all, we're going to say, God, it's you and me. I'm not trying to do this on my own. The reason why the wilderness generation is brought up is because they decided to do it on their own and because they did it on their own terms they didn't enter God's rest so therefore you New Testament believer you who have found rest in Jesus Christ don't give up on the rest that you can experience because God has a rest that is yet to come you see the children of Israel weren't the only people who were promised a new place Jesus told his disciples in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, then I will come back and I'll take you to be with me forever. The promise of the promised land was the Old Testament fulfillment of all the blessings of God. The New Testament, what we have been given is a promised place where there's no more crying, no more sorrow, no more pain. The old way of things is gone and the new has come. Are you understanding what he's doing here? He's saying, listen, don't think you crossed the finish line the moment you accepted Jesus. You just started in this wilderness experience. There's more to come. And so here the devil fights us. Here the devil tempts us. Here's where the writer of Hebrews says, you're drifting away from the rest God wants to give you. Now right away, you say, Tim, what is the rest? What is it? Write this down. I'm going to leave it up on the screens for a while. And I know you don't have a lot of space in your, in your outline, so put it somewhere. If you've got to write sideways, I don't care. Get it on your piece of paper. God's rest is the present position of blessing and abundance offered to all believers who trust and rely on God alone in all circumstances. That's important. Underline that when you write that. This is in all circumstances because it's easy to trust and rely on God when things are good. But when things are bad, like the Hebrews of the book of Hebrews, when things weren't going the way they wanted to in that wilderness experience they were facing, being pressed down and persecuted, you got to trust God and you got to rely on God alone in those moments. Why do we trust? Why do we rely on God? Because of what God has done for us in the past. So in the present, if things aren't going the way we do, we're reminded of what God did for us in the present. Just as the children of Israel, as they're wandering, things aren't going the way they want. Well, wait a minute. God rescued us from Egypt, so surely he's not just going to leave us here dead. So he's got something. So we look to what God did in the past. 
and we realize what God has promised to do for us in the future. Now you say, okay, how is this going to help me this week? How in the world do I apply this? I learned about God's rest as a freshman in high school. And I remember when I saw an individual experience God's rest, it was the most singular, attractive thing I had ever seen in my life. It was an epiphany moment. I'm going to share the story, and I'm going to share it in a lot more totality than I've ever shared it before. That rest moment, that rest epiphany happened on September 17th, 1990. I was a freshman in high school. Many of you have heard this story. It was a Monday morning. And the reason why that Monday morning was so significant was what happened the night before. I have two brothers. I have an older brother, Chris, and a younger brother, Joel. My older brother, Chris, who was a senior at the time, we were attending this church, and my brother had gone to a youth group gathering like the youth group gatherings that many of you kids are a part of today. And at that youth group gathering that went on for some time, my brother, like most teenagers, was burning the candle on both ends, okay? And amidst that, he was growing more and more tired. My parents had warned him, just as I warned my own boys, hey, you got to sleep, you can't stay up all night, and then get up and do school and work and hang out with friends. And that would catch up to my brother, Sometime around 11.30 that night on his way home from a youth group activity on Route 30 between Big Rock and Hinkley where we lived, my brother fell asleep at the wheel, went off the road and was killed instantly. Thank goodness that night my mom who always stayed up like most of you teenage parents who stay up waiting for your kids, that night my mom fell asleep herself on the couch. The next morning, beautiful September morning, we wake up, my parents come to my room, have you seen Chris? Where's Chris? He's not here, his car's not here, do you know where he's at? No, I don't know where he's at. They start making phone calls to different kids, hey, have you seen Chris? Where's Chris? They send me to school, I get on the bus, head to school, and they tell me, my dad's last words are, when you see Chris, tell him I want to hear from him now, okay? He had not shown up. So I go to class, I spend the first two hours of my class, the second hour is my math class, and I remember I'm starting to see people start talking amongst themselves. We live in a small community. And what I had come to realize is some of the firefighters that probably were called out for that um, situation had already known. And I'm sitting there, unbeknownst to me, going through class, and I'm thinking rumors are starting to go around that Chris has done something really bad. And there's part of me, let me just be honest, I'm kind of excited to hear what my older brother's gotten himself into and uh, kind of enjoying the fact he's going to get in a whole lot of trouble. I get out of my class. If you've ever been to Hinkley Big Rock High School, our, our school is filled with long hallways that meet in the center, this apex. And that's where the school office was. And I remember stepping out and looking down the long hallway, and I see my dad. And my dad's there, and I'm like, oh, Chris is in real trouble. Dad showed up to beat up on Chris for doing whatever he did. And as I'm walking closer to it, I realize that my dad doesn't look mad there's this blank stare in my dad's eyes. And then I look at my guidance counselor and she's bawling her eyes out. And I'm like, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense to me. And as I get closer, my dad says, Tim, we've gotta go home. Something's happened, I'll tell you about it in the car. And I said, dad, what's going on? Where's Chris, you know? Isn't Chris coming home with us? And so now I'm thinking maybe he's been arrested. He's done something which is out of character for Chris. This doesn't seem to make any sense. And so as we're walking out the, the doors of the high school, I demand my dad tell me, Dad, where's Chris? And he tells me the words, Chris is dead. We go home. And I want you to know my family, my parents, godly people. Uh, they were godly people at all the churches we attended. They were the ones that were there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. They taught in Awana. The, their faith, man, it, it was the real deal. And I remember sitting there, and as we're driving home, what's going on in my head is, God, how could you do this? My parents, they've done everything you've asked of them. 
And this is how you repay them? You take their son, you, you kill him? That's what you do? I don't want nothing to do with you. You kidding me? They put all their chips on you and this is how you are going to repay them. It only gets worse, my friends. I get home, the police are there, they've shared and they're doing all of their work, God bless them. And they stayed with my mom who has crumbled down in our foyer of their home and she's pleading with them, she's screaming at them, bring me my son. You have my son, I want my son. I couldn't take it, it was so heart-wrenching. I went downstairs and stayed where Chris's room was at and I'm like, Lord, this is the worst. You are the worst. I don't want nothing to do with you. If this is how you operate, I don't want you. And I was like Job's wife that said, mom, dad, curse God and die. This is terrible. We have to go and we have to identify his body. And so we go with a couple close friends from this church. We drive to Mercy Center Hospital in Aurora. They take us down to the basement to a very, very cold and sterile place that's the morgue. And they say, listen, Chris's body is in this other room. 16 years old, man, look at him, beautiful, good looking guy. He'd kill me, I said beautiful. Good looking guy, all of life there. And my dad takes his family. Listen, this is where it gets really cuts close to me. My dad's 41 years of age at this time. Three years younger than I am today. And he takes his little family and we walk into that room and we see my brother, their son's mangled body. And I'm like, this is it. Dad's gonna give it to God. He's gonna call out God. He's gonna say, enough, I'm done. And my dad does the unthinkable. He looks at us and he pulls us together. I don't, I don't know where this came from. Listen, my dad is an immigrant from Iraq. He came at the age of 16 years of age. He has at best an eighth grade education. He writes at somewhere of the level of the fourth grade. If you see him spell, it's second grade, okay? He is not what you would say, an educated man of means. But listen, you know what's better than that? He loved Jesus. Because what he did is, I remember he pulled us together and he said, boys, he said, honey, speaking to my mom, he said, God gives. And he says, with tears running down his eye, God's given us a lot. He's given us life, he's given us breath, he, breath. he's graced us with, with every gift under heaven. He graced us with Chris. And he says, but the Lord takes away. And he says, and you know what we're gonna say? You know what the Badals are going to say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. At 14 years, I'm sitting there watching this and I'm like, this makes no absolute sense, but every part of my inner being said, I want that. How do you do that? How do you have peace amidst that storm? I want that, I want that in all its fullness. And then my dad with tears and, and grunts, crying out, grieving, he began to lead our family in a worship service in the morgue. And I said, this is supernatural. This is not what the world offers. The world says there's no hope for this. And what I've experienced from that day forward are the promises of God that in the good, the bad, and the ugly of life, listen to me, I am going to strive to enter God's rest. Because in that moment, at that point in history, my mom and my dad leaned in and strived in that moment to grab hold of the rest that they could only find in God. And you know what God did? He met them. Did it hurt? Yep. Did they cry and mourn? Yep. Were there ugly days after that? Yep. Were there days where they yelled and screamed to God? Yep. But God said, I'm with you. I'll not leave you. I will not forsake you. And that is the kind of rest, friends, that God wants you to have. 
That's why this rest is so very important. Because in this pilgrimage, in this wilderness we call the world, the world's going to beat us up. The world and its circumstances is going to cause us great pain. But you and I can find rest when we lean into the Lord. Now, very quickly, a couple things. What disqualifies us from that rest? There are two things, okay? So what disqualifies us? First of all, fear disqualifies us. What disqualified those children of Israel from entering the promised land? Listen very carefully. Their present circumstances, the fear of the present circumstances caused their fear to outweigh their faith. So fear leads to faithlessness. Now, the children of Israel left Egypt with the fear of God in their eyes, but when they saw the giants in the land, they feared their circumstances more than they had faith in God. You and I will never enter God's rest if the fear and anxieties of today trump your faith in an almighty God. You'll always be anxious. You'll always be worried. You'll always be filled with with fear and dread when those circumstances of today outweigh the faith that you have in God. So fear and faithlessness is what led that generation to not experience God's rest. So what is the writer's encouragement? Strive, toil, work, sweat, do what you have to, enter that rest. How do we do it? Committing daily to resting finally and fully in Christ alone. You want the abundant life God promises? You want to live amidst blessing? You want to know when September 17th, 1990s hit your life like they did my life? You want to know how to have buoyancy in your boat when the storms of life come? You rest in the Lord. Well, what again, this rest, what is it? It's God's gift to you. It's God's gift, write this down, it's God's gift for you to examine your work, to embrace his grace, and to enjoy his goodness. So, we're here. We've dedicated a day to rest. What are we doing right now? We're examining our work. Am I resting like God calls me to? Did I rest in God's strength and not my own this last week? Well, if you're like me, you'll say, yeah, I did sometimes, but other times I failed miserably. That is where we then, the rest of God says, then ask for forgiveness. Confess your sins and he's faithful to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So you examine, I didn't live in light of God's rest. I want to. And God says, okay, today don't harden your heart. Enter God's rest. And in doing so, you and I will enjoy the goodness of God. Listen, that doesn't mean you'll enjoy the goodness of God in the good times. But listen, the rest where you will enjoy it most is when the world comes collapsing down upon you. Where you can say, it's okay. I'm more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Now I'm gonna ask the worship team to come forward and finish out our, our time today in song. And as they do, I found this quote from Pastor John Piper and I think it's a great way to end our message on what it means to strive and what it means to rest. And then what we're going to do is our worship team is going to lead us in a song that I hope is a song where we invite the Lord or we, we invite ourselves into the rest of God. But this is what John Piper says. The Christian life is a life of day to day, hour by hour trust in the promises of God to help us and to guide us and to take care of us to forgive us and bring us into a future of holiness and joy that will satisfy our hearts infinitely more than if we forsake him and put our trust in ourselves or in the promises of this world. And that day by day, hour by hour, that trust in God's promises, it's not automatic. We gotta strive for it, right? But it's the result of daily diligence And it's the result of proper fear. 
Brothers and sisters, my prayer for you this week is that you would rest and give the day in, day out times of life back to the Creator God who has gifted you with the rest that you can experience in all circumstances. Make that your prayer. Lord, I'm resting in you and will continue to do so knowing you love me and have a plan to use all that comes in my life for my good and for your glory. Let's stand and let's sing this song together as our prayer.